Hi, you're watching Teen Kids News. I'm Lila. We're all excited to be part of a very special anniversary. This is our 20th season on the air. More on that later in the program. But now, let's get to our top story. The immense size of the ocean no doubt makes it seem like it's indestructible. But as Emily tells us, our ocean is becoming sicker by the day. And we need to take action now. It's a grim list of destructive forces attacking the world's ocean. Giant floating islands of garbage are creating dead zones. Overfishing is pushing many species dangerously close to extinction. The fossil fuels we burn are causing the ocean to become so acidic, marine life is dying. Power plants that use fossil fuels are said to be responsible for the mercury that's poisoning our waters. These are issues created by humans. The good news is that humans are coming up with solutions to fight back. One organization on the front line of the fight to save our seas is the Canadian group called OceanWise. Joining us from OceanWise is Lasse Gustafsson. What are the biggest threats to our oceans? So I think the biggest threat to the oceans is actually that not enough people care. You're right, of course, that climate change, pollution and overfishing are tremendous problems, but the biggest challenge is to have enough people to care and take action to help protect and restore the ocean. No surprise, that's the heart of the mission of OceanWise, to protect and restore the world's oceans. Let's talk about how you're working to do that. Starting with a man-made product that is literally choking our planet, plastic. So you may have a rain jacket or, or a fleece jacket that you wash, and when you wash it, the microfibers from your jacket ends up in the ocean. So we are working with great companies like Patagonia or Arcteryx to figure out a better way to designing these jackets. Another way we're addressing uh, the plastic challenge is we work with restaurants and hotels to see how can we reduce plastics in their operations. We are cleaning beaches. So last year in Canada alone, we cleaned about 2000 beaches um, and we find plastics everywhere, of course. So that's the three different ways that we work on, on improving the health of the ocean by taking plastics out of the ocean, but also making sure that we reduce the amount of plastic that ends up in the ocean eventually. The ocean plays an important role in controlling the climate, doesn't it? Yeah, so, so the most fascinating thing I think with the oceans is it has an impact in everybody's life. Why? Because the world's oxygen is produced by algae in the ocean. Other things that are contributed from the ocean is fish and seafood. So a lot of people are depending on fish and seafood for their main source of protein. We've seen the last 30, 40 years, we've been taking too much fish and seafood out of the ocean. There's less of it in the ocean and we need to rebuild the ocean abundance. In addition to algae producing oxygen, another ocean plant plays an important role in reducing poisonous carbon dioxide. Yeah, so, so my absolute favorite plant in the world is kelp. Kelp is a seaweed. It's the fastest growing plant on the planet. It can, can grow up to a foot a day if the conditions are right. And it does many good things for us. One of the most important things is it captures carbon and it takes carbon out of the atmosphere. That's why OceanWise has a plan to plant more than 5,000 hectares of kelp. So you at home can appreciate how much that is. Just one hectare is the size of a football field. So imagine 5,000 football fields of new kelp. We call it sea forestation. You might have heard reforestation, so we plant trees on land. That's amazing. Planting kelp and other seaweed in the ocean is even better because they are more effective at binding carbon. The oceans are so vast and the problems so big. Can we really make a difference? There's no doubt that a small group of passionate people can make a difference and young people like you in particular. I've been an environmentalist for 40 years. Uh, you hear I have a funny accent, it's because I'm Swedish. You would think after 40 years, I'd be one of the most important environmentalists in the world, but no, it's the teenage fellow Swede of mine, Greta Thunberg and other teenagers that has the ear of decision makers of today. So my role and the role of more experienced uh, environmentalists is to support teenagers and other young people to take action. 
Okay, so how can we do that? Buying seafood which has an ocean-wise label, if you know you go into a supermarket, there's an ocean-wise sticker on, you know this is a better choice. You can do it by cleaning up your favorite shoreline. You can do a, like a plastics audit. You look around plastics in your house, in your school, and you can think about better ways than using plastics. You can find a way to get to school. Maybe you can bike, maybe there is public transport. If you are being driven to school, maybe you have an important role in the back seat of the car and say, can we have a smarter car? Can we have a less polluting car than the one we have? Many, many things. But I think the most important message for me is we need to do things. Talking about things and learning about things is really important, but what really makes change happen is when you do things differently. And that's where teenagers and young people are so much better than old people like myself. There's action, and that's the action we need. That's certainly encouraging. Thanks for talking with us. My pleasure. Thank you so much. In upcoming programs, we'll be checking in with OceanWise for updates on teens taking action. In the meantime, if you'd like to participate in any of the programs run by OceanWise, visit their website. There's literally an ocean of opportunities to dive into. For Teen Kids News, I'm Emily. Not all sunglasses are created equal, and some may actually be doing more harm than good. I'll explain when Teen Kids News returns. Quick, what do all these photos have in common? I'll give you some hints. When movie stars wear them, they become all the rage. You'll see them on musical performers, whether on or off the stage. Astronauts take them into space. On our military, they never look out of place. They help athletes keep their eyes on the ball. Even presidents wear them, you might recall. Yep, we're talking about sunglasses. They've been around far longer than you might think. Prehistoric people in the Arctic Circle made an early form of protection from the sun by cutting slits into animal bone. Over the years, sunglasses have certainly changed and improved. We wear them today to not only see better, but to look good. And of course, to protect our eyes from the bright sunlight or snow glare. But here's something that might surprise you. Wearing the wrong type of sunglasses can actually harm your eyes. It's really important to get sunglasses with the proper UV protection. All right, so let's check your vision now, okay? Okay, so. Dr. Ronnie Bannock is a doctor specially trained to treat eye problems. She's an ophthalmologist. So UV stands for ultraviolet. They're very, very short, high energy rays, and they can really do damage to our eyes. So we absolutely need to protect our eyes from UV rays, both UVA and UVB rays. UV rays are why we need to wear suntan lotion. The lotion helps protect our skin from the sun's harmful rays. And that's why you should wear shades that have UV protection built in. Sunglasses that don't have 100% UV protection may put you at a greater risk for eye problems than not wearing any sunglasses at all. So if you wear sunglasses that are dark but don't have UV protection, that will cause your pupil to get very wide and it'll actually let in more harmful rays. You're actually potentially doing more harm to your eyes than good. But don't confuse glasses that say they're polarized with glasses that protect from UV. So it's really important to make that distinction. So UV is not the same as polarized. Polarized lenses basically cut the glare. If you're in bright sunlight, for example, if you're on the water and there's a lot of sun coming off the water, or if you're skiing, it will definitely cut down the glare, but it's not UV protecting. And of course, you can find sunglasses that have both polarized and UV treated lenses. And don't think you can wait to take steps to protect your eyes. Most people get their UV exposure when they're younger, usually when they're kids and teenagers, so that's really a critical time to protect your eyes. So start early, wear those 100% UV blocking sunglasses. We're not sure just how early superstar Elton John began wearing sunglasses, but we do know he really loves his shades. In fact, the man who sings Don't Let the Sun Go Down on Me reportedly owns more than 250,000 pairs. If Elton wore a different pair a day, he wouldn't have to worry about the sun going down or up for 684 years. As long as all those sunglasses have good UV protection, of course. For Teen Kids News, I'm Dean. What's in the name? Even if you've never visited Washington, D.C., you'll no doubt recognize this majestic building. It's called the U.S. Capitol. Except that wasn't the U.S. Capitol. 
Look again. See anything strange? How about the people walking in the background? The Capitol, the Washington Monument, and the other buildings are all made from Legos. Ever since 1949, kids and adults around the world have been playing with these brightly colored interlocking plastic bricks. And some pretty amazing things have been made out of Legos. A giant hero bot, an aircraft carrier that floats, a full-size house with a working bathroom, even a giant X-wing fighter from Star Wars. But perhaps the most meaningful creation was this tower in Israel. It was built in memory of an eight-year-old boy who loved playing with Legos, even as he was dying of cancer. It took more than half a million plastic bricks. When completed, the tower broke the record for the tallest Lego structure, soaring 118 feet. Legos were invented by a toy maker living in Denmark. The name Lego comes from the word leg got, which in Danish means play well. And that's exactly what generations of us have been doing with Legos, playing well. With What's in a Name, I'm Veronique. We have to take a quick break, but don't go away because Teen Kids News will be right back. It's the world's most famous painting, and yet there's an awful lot that even the experts don't know about it. I'm talking about the Mona Lisa, painted by Leonardo da Vinci. First of all, no one is exactly sure when da Vinci created his masterpiece. Most agree that it was sometime between 1502 and 1506. And just who is the lady in the picture? It's generally believed that she was the wife of a wealthy silk merchant. Another mystery is why Mona Lisa doesn't have eyebrows. Actually, she does or once did. Digital scanning uncovered traces of the missing brows. Apparently, they faded with time. If imitation is the highest form of flattery, da Vinci has a lot to be proud of. Another giant of Renaissance art, Raphael, was so taken with Mona Lisa's unusual pose that he copied it in his painting, Young Woman with a Unicorn. Notice how similar the body positions are. In fact, Raphael copied the pose yet again. As I said, imitation is a form of flattery. Mona Lisa is said to be invaluable. What makes it so special? Critics usually cite two main reasons. Both have to do with her smile. It's been called enigmatic, which is another way of saying mysterious. She seems to be hiding a secret. Some scholars believe that she had just found out she was pregnant. Another thing that's special is the way her smile appears different from different angles. Interestingly, this painting became famous because of a crime. In 1911, it was stolen from the Paris Museum, the Louvre. For two years, France was virtually in a state of national mourning. The theft made the Mona Lisa a household name. The painting was finally recovered and put back on display. Now world famous, the portrait was victimized two more times. In the 1950s, acid was thrown at it, but only the bottom was slightly damaged. A few months after that, a man threw a rock, leaving a mark on her left elbow. That's why the painting is now displayed behind bulletproof glass. It's the most popular work of art at the Louvre. People really love this portrait. I mean, really. So many have written letters, including love letters to the painting, that the Mona Lisa has its own mailbox at the museum, the only painting so honored. With Art Smart, I'm Katie. Washington is called the Evergreen State and is taking a dramatic step to live up to its nickname. To reduce harmful fossil fuels, the state is requiring all new vehicles to be electric by no later than 2030. Although roads were built for cars, they're also shared by people walking, biking, or riding on scooters. And that's the subject of this next video from the National Road Safety Foundation. I'm excited to show you the sites here in Washington. Cool, I'm learning about them in school. Look, there's the U.S. Capitol. Auntie, what's that? The Lincoln Memorial. And of course, that's the... Look out! <gasps> when we return, we'll catch up with another member of our news team who used to do what I'm doing now. The celebration of our 20th anniversary continues when Teen Kids News returns. 
Don't go away. For weeks now, we've been telling you that this is a very important season for Teen Kids News. We've now been on the air for 20 years. Over that time, nine teens have sat in this anchor chair. Let's meet one of them. Experts say we need to eat a certain amount of fruits and vegetables every day. They call this the recommended number of servings. I'm Brandon and I started Teen Kids News as a reporter in 2012 and then eventually became an anchor for Teen Kids News. Saturday morning programs began at 9.30 in the morning, Teen Kids News would come on. And I said, I've got to be a part of that some way, some shape, some form. And I discovered it that way, just watching it myself. In recent years, bees have been disappearing from their hives. Just why, we're not exactly sure. So it, it was a lifelong dream of mine to be a news anchor, and I always thought, hey, I'd have to you know, go to college first and be an intern at some network, and then I'd get to be a reporter, correspondent, and work my way up to anchor. But to be an anchor in high school and be on television was pretty awesome. Let's begin with our top story. So my favorite uh, memory from Teen Kids News is when I did the on-location shoot at the Enterprise uh, Space Shuttle on the Intrepid. This was the world's first reusable spacecraft. That's why it's called a shuttle. I love space and I love talking to people. And I got to learn a lot about the space shuttle, space, and I got to interview people who were there to see the space shuttle themselves. So I'm in college now, earning my communications degree so that I can do what I was doing on Team Kids News professionally. And I feel like I have a leg up on the competition, so to speak, the other students in the class, simply because I learned so much from being on Team Kids News. I just know so much more than all the other students in the class. I think Team Kids News is important because it allows young people to understand the so-called adult media. Uh, there are stories sometimes in the news that are harder for young people to understand, but I think Teen Kids News allows for uh, a better processing of that information. Coming up, of all the places in Europe, this Spanish city has had the greatest influence on America. I'll explain when Teen Kids News returns. It's a city with deep ties to two famous explorers. One discovered a so-called new world. The other went on to circumnavigate the globe. In her series, The Rain in Spain, Nicole takes us to Seville. Seville is a beautiful city along the edge of a major river. It was from here that two historic expeditions sailed into the history books. Carmen is our guide in Seville. So both Columbus and Magellan have connections with Seville? Yes, actually because Columbus, he started his expedition over here, he met with the Catholic king over here, and Magallanes also started the expedition from here. In 1519, Ferdinand Magellan set out with five ships. His plan was to sail west to reach India. Only one ship returned to Seville, but not with Magellan. He had died during the historic voyage. Having survived storms and mutinies, Magellan was killed by islanders in the Philippines, but his fleet sailed on. After three years at sea, just the ship Victoria limped back into Seville's harbor. Her crew were the first to circumnavigate the globe. They had sailed completely around the Earth. But, of course, the most famous explorer to ever sail from Seville, or from anywhere for that matter, was this guy, Christopher Columbus. And that happened in... In 1492, Christopher Columbus sailed the Great Blue or so. I forget the rhyme. It's like rhymes with blue. 1492. Columbus set sail the blue. Christopher Columbus sailed the ocean blue in 1492. 
Yes, that's true. Columbus did sail the ocean blue in 1492. And on October 12th, he landed on an island in the Bahamas. Columbus would go on to make three more trips to the New World. This is the Alcazar. It's the royal palace in Seville. Carmen told me that this is where Columbus was granted an audience with King Ferdinand and his wife, Queen Isabella. In fact, they met right here, in the Admiral's room. If not for that fateful meeting here in Seville, the history of North and South America might have been completely different. In Spain, for Teen Kids News, I'm Nicole. Well, that wraps up our show for this week. But we'll be back with more Teen Kids News next week. See you then.